Um, welcome. This is the new and revised introduction on Steora. This is a newcomer's class. Uh, it's intended for new members or for recent transplants on Steora. Um, I will be, uh, <coughs> excuse me, number one, I'll be drinking prodigiously throughout the class because the weather has played hell with my sinuses as well as a few other parts of my body. Um, I'm going to be your instructor. Um, my name is Ivo Blackhawk. Uh, I'm a quarter century player in the SCA, uh, coming up on my 25th year uh, this September, as a matter of fact. Um, I have uh, been an officer at the local regional, regional and deputy to kingdom levels. I've been event steward, co-steward, I've been the herald in charge, and I've been deputy herald in charge for Gulf Wars for four years in a row uh, at one point. Um, what we're going to be covering today, uh, we're going to do a basic breakdown, very beginning early breakdown of how the SCA got started and how it grew. Um, we are going to talk about uh, the more recent information of how COVID has changed the society, which I believe is very important for new members because just in general conversation, just in talking with older members, you're going to hear references to stuff that if you don't understand how COVID radically change the SCA. A lot of what they say is not going to make any sense. Um, we are going to go over the royal arm of leadership. We're going to talk about the administrative arm. And we're going to talk about award recommendations, the award structure, and the kingdom of Anstiora. Um, a couple of things we're not going to talk about, uh, just because these aren't topics that I feel like covering or feel like are important at this stage. Um, this is not going to be a detailed history of Anstiora. Um, that would be a four-hour class to itself, which I'm not qualified to teach. Um, we are not going to discuss politics, mundane or SCA. Uh, we will be hinting at some of the cornerstones of um, some differences within the kingdom, but we are not going to get into he said, she said politics. That's not why we're here. There will be no dirty laundry conversations. I'm not here to make anyone look bad or yell at anyone or, or talk about anyone. Um, and as much as this sounds appealing, what this is not going to do, this is not going to be how-to instructions for early progress in the SC. I'm going to give you the building blocks, but the fact of the matter is, is that how you progress in the SCA really is customized to what you want to do, where you play, and the dynamic of the people around you. So I'm going to give you as much information as I can, but there is no checklist that's going to get you, um, that's going to advance you in the SCA that I can give everyone. Uh, the SCA started all the way back in 1966. Uh, it was a costume party. Um, some people I've heard have tried to romanticize this or, or give it higher ideals. This was a bunch of college students at a costume party in celebration of, I believe, one of the first people there had successfully defended her thesis. Um, and they decided to hold a medieval themed costume party. Um, several of the costumes were from noted fantasy characters, um, one of which I believe was Galadriel from Lord of the Rings, um, obviously back before it was cool because this predated the movies by uh, a number of decades, of course. The, uh, the party was preceded by a parade slash mock protest of the modern day, and it included a tournament. Um, one of the men there, everyone, all the fighters called themselves Sir This and Sir That, and one of the men decided that if everyone's a knight, there needs to be a squire, so he introduced himself as a squire. And the presiding uh, figurehead of the day, who named herself Queen, um, knighted this individual after his day on the field. Um, and when they were done, they had a big dinner party that a uh, few people were bringing out courses from the kitchen. If all of this sounds vaguely familiar, these are, of course, um, these are the cornerstones of what the SCA has grown into. These are all the initial starting points that have grown into the, the foundations of the SCA culture at events. Um, the SCA actually got its name uh, from Marion Zimmer Bradley. And uh, per Bradley, per an interview with her that I have read three accounts of, um, there was no high ideal about this. She was in line at a Parks and Recreation office filling out a form to rent a park for an upcoming uh, event. And they'd, they'd been a thing less than a year, I believe. 
And at the top of the form, it says, what's the name of your group? They didn't have a name, so she made one up on the spot. Society for Creative Anachronisms, SCA. And that is where we get our name from. Um, from those humble beginnings, the SCA currently spans 20 kingdoms across North America, Europe, Australia, and the Pacific Coast of Asia. Most of the Pacific Coast um, right now is either directly or adjacent to uh, U.S. military bases. Uh, some of the larger ones, of course, that have a large civilian population. Um, though there are now, we are now starting to see uh, independent um, uh Asian population city-centric groups cropping up uh, peripheral to those. Um, also, I've, I recently was informed there is a group in South Africa as well. Um, the governing body for the entirety of the SCA is the Board of Directors. Now, most SCA policy and activities are managed at the kingdom level, but understand that the Board of Directors, um, they maintain what is called corpora, which is the society law. And these are the framework that guarantees everyone's playing by the same rules and how we run events. It maintains minimum safety standards for all of our activities uh, and our general policies and procedures. They also maintain our insurance policies for the society. Now, I know that sounds really pedestrian and really bureaucratic, but if you've ever run an event or if you talk to an event steward, one of the first questions some sites ask you is, um, we're going to need a copy of your insurance. Um, the simple fact that we have liability insurance, which most organizations do, this is nothing special, there is nothing really amazing about that, but there are a number of groups, there are a number of groups outside the SCA who cannot do what we do because when they go to rent property, they don't carry liability insurance. So that is a major boon to us, and that lets us do a lot of really great things because we're able to play at that level. Uh, inside the United States, uh, the SCA is registered with the IRS as a 501c3 not-for-profit educational organization. Now, the reason that is important is when the SCA is purchasing goods or material for its events, uh, has a group, not per individuals, um, we are afforded tax-free status in most of the uh, 50 states and the various U.S. territories, um, which... For some of the purchases we make, that is actually a uh, that is a not small amount of money we are saving. Um, and one really good example, um, my uh, my old group, the Province of Moonshadow, using its 501c not for profit tax exempt status, shaved something like two hundred dollars off its purchase of a full length Connex container that it uses for its provincial shed. Um, and if any of you have ever watched uh, a military unit load out all of their stuff into a Connex container, that's about the efficiency Moonshadow can pack that damn thing down, I'm here to tell you. Um, but just a little bit of, of fun trivia for you uh, and also some context of where we sit administratively uh, in our relationship with uh, government agencies. I do not know what our status is in Europe, Canada, or Asia. Um, or even what laws we have to do, considering um, most of our Asian members, Asian continental membership, are actually U.S. citizens in the military. But um, the majority of SCAs are in the United States and uh, do fall under the 501c3 status. Now, this is not a current map of the known world. Uh, as I understand it, I think there are 19 kingdoms shown here. Um, let me get out of the way so you can see LOCAC in the bottom left corner. I believe there are 19. The, if you look up in the upper left, the kingdom of Antir, my understanding is that the newest kingdom is uh, part of the coastal region of the northern part of Antir. Don't quote me on that. But my point is, is uh, if you look at this, this is still a very functional map. It still gives you a very good idea of our geometry, where everyone is related to everyone else. Um, as you can see, the bottom center of that is on Steora. Um, our neighbors are the Outlands, Glen Aubin and Calentir. Uh, next to Glen Aubin, you can see Meridies, and below them are Trimeris. On Steora, Glen Aubin, Meridies, Trimeris. Those are the four principal players for Gulf Wars, which, as you can see, between those four kingdoms, that is a not small fraction of the known world, which is why Gulf Wars, uh, in its prime, was the second largest war in the society. Um, 
it uh, uh, the lettering isn't very good in this image, but Europe is under the jurisdiction of the Kingdom of Drakenfalt, which is all of Europe, and uh, Lokak or Lohak, uh, depending on how it's pronounced. It was named by Australians and is pronounced by Australians, and I can't do the name justice, and I've tried. Um, but uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, is uh, under the domain of the king and queen of Lokak. All right, so I do want to talk a little bit about this um, kind of a little known fact, but a really important gem, and that is the uh, ombudsman. The ombudsman is a representative or a ambassador, if you will, from the board of directors to your kingdom. Now there is one ombudsman assigned to each kingdom. Actually, each ombudsman is assigned to two or three kingdoms in reality. They are not from the kingdom they are representing. Um, that is specific. And, and deliberate, um, the ombudsman is assigned with the idea that he is not part of the mix and the the day to day goings on of the kingdom, so he can answer questions uh, impartially. Now, ombudsman may be contacted by e email uh, with policy questions or concern. Now, this is their primary purpose for being there. The ombudsman is designed to increase transparency and to answer questions on par on behalf of the board of directors. A really good example, um, suppose, and this has happened, I have, I have written several emails to my ombudsman. This is not a uncommon occurrence, but there have been times the board of directors has released a statement or a directive or an order or a change in society law that on its face made no sense to me. I, I looked at it and I could not wrap my head around what the heck was going on. So I wrote the ombudsman and I said, I actually wrote, I mean, I remember one letter where I literally said is, um, I believe his uh, SCA name was St. John or something to that effect. And I wrote him and I said, I have read your missive four times. I speak English as my first and only language. This makes no sense. Please tell me where you all forgot a verb or something. Um, he got a little snarky with me on reply, but it was all in good fun. I, there was no bad blood. And he explained what they were doing. And the reality is, is almost everyone who read that missive had been following another thread of conversations. And without that context, because I had not been following that, the missive made no sense. But when he showed me the thread and he showed me the conversations they were referring to, all of a sudden it made sense. It was a really good conversation, very brief conversation, very efficient conversation. But by engaging me, by being able to answer my question quickly, uh, and it was, I think turnaround on that was a day. He, he got back to me really quick. Um, he was able to answer that question and prevent it from, from cascading into what we all know can become an email storm or social media storm of this makes no sense what's going on. Next thing they know, they've got 300 people screaming you know, this doesn't make any sense when the fact of the matter is it does, but one person didn't understand it and started that domino effect. Now, how to find out who your ombudsman is, is you go to the uh, society website, sca.org, um, and I believe, I believe it'll be under the contact links, um, but you can search for ombudsman on that page and it will list, uh, it'll take you to the ombudsman's listing and then you just search for your kingdom. Now this is intended as a line of communication to help increase transparency. I cannot emphasize that enough. Do not, under any circumstances, approach an ombudsman for as a first level escalation for some sort of internal conflict between you and someone else. I don't care if you had a knockdown drag out argument with the King of Ansteora. If you take that to the ombudsman, I can tell you exactly what he's going to do. Number one, he's not going to reply to you. Number two, he's going to forward your email to the Kingdom Seneschal. Number three, you're then going to get a call from the Kingdom Seneschal explaining how this is not a first level escalation point of contact. You're not asking a question, you're grousing about someone, and it's not what the Ombudsman is there for. Um, however, I want to reemphasize, the Ombudsmen are not these, these high level, omnipotent, untouchable figures. They are people who are volunteers who have to make some really tough decisions, especially in the last couple of years. And... They want us to understand their reasons and their rationale behind their decisions. And reaching out to your ombudsman, reaching, or the, rather the board of directors want this, reaching out to your ombudsman is 
they're offering to us to answer our questions. So moving on, um, now let's get down to uh, why we're all here, the Kingdom of Ansteora. We were established in 1979. Um, the name, uh, give you an idea of uh, how much influence Texas had over this process. Ansteora actually is Old English and it means one star. Um, it's composed of most of the lands of Texas and Oklahoma. At, at one point in time, I believe it was officially measured at seven, geographically, I think we're 780 miles north to south. I think southernmost population center to northernmost population center, that's a little closer to like 625 or something because we don't have any population centers on the immediate borders. But it's a massive and expansive kingdom um, when you look at it on a map and consider drive times between some groups. Now, more recently, um, we have within the kingdom of Ansteora, we have the principality, principality of Vindheim. Um, now, this is uh, established in December of 2021. The name Vindheim means uh, windland. Now, it's composed of all of Oklahoma uh, and Wichita Falls, and I, I need to add this, but also Amarillo, Texas. Um, so that is the, the component groups for the principality. Now, some people don't know what a principality is, and, and the best summary I can give you is, think of a principality. First of all, it is a collection of groups that that uh, meet under and are governed by a singular authority. But it is part of the kingdom of Ansteora. Now, this relationship is best paralleled by looking at a modern day state within the United States um, each state has a separate government, but also is underneath and answers to the U.S. federal government. Um, very similar relationship, of course, to the provinces of Canada. Again, each province is its own independent legal municipality, but is also underneath and subject to the federal laws of the government of Canada. Um, without a principality, Ansteora is a direct leadership model. That would be like every state and county in the United States answering directly to the federal government, um, which obviously can't work in practicality, but I'm simply using that as a model. Um, the rest of Ansteora, everything that is not Vindheim, is still a direct model. All of the individual groups, uh, at least at the royal level, answer directly to the crown. In Vindheim, um, all of the local groups answer to principality officers and those officers uh, answer to the uh, kingdom. Now we do have regional uh, deputies and we'll get to that in a minute, but I just want to uh, highlight the structural differences. Uh, Vindheim is a recognized group with the board of directors, uh, is established in, is now established in kingdom law and is recognized by the society. We are ruled by uh, royals, just like the kingdom. Our royals, our prince and princess over the principality uh, do answer to the king and queen. Um, we have a full docket of officers. The principality officers are called greater officers of state. They are still subordinate to the kingdom officers, but, but they all are part of the swath of greater officers of state per society law. Um, now we're going to talk about kingdom leadership. Kingdom leadership can be broken down into two parts. Uh, one is the royal arm. This is the king and queen or royals or the crowns. All three of those are appropriate terms uh, for Ansteora. The, the decision for who is going to become crown is made at crown tournament and the winner of crown tournament becomes the crown heirs. Uh, again, prince and princess is the appropriate title, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about we're gonna separate out who all the different prince and princesses are. Um, but you have the king and queen, and then for three months out of every reign, you have a prince and princess or heirs to the throne. Separate from that prince and princess, you have the territorial prince and princess over Vindheim. They are the next down in the uh, hierarchy. Um, and beneath that, you have the landed barons and baronesses of 
the kingdom, and they preside over each individual barony, which are the largest groups. And then you have um, the peers of the realm, and those are the knights, the pelicans, the royals, and the masters of defense. Now, I know I'm throwing a lot at you. Stick with me. We are going to get into this in a little more detail. But I just want to get these terms out there for you to hear and see, and then we'll flesh them out. Now, now I've got the administrative arm. The administrative arm, this is a whole different animal. Um, these are the kingdom officers, uh, and uh, a lot of kingdom officers have um, a pretty large assortment of specialized deputies, so I do want to point out the deputies are there as well. They are not greater officers, but they answer directly to the greater officers and are integral to the kingdom's functionality as well. Um, immediately beneath the kingdom officers are the principality officers who are also, like I said, greater officers of state. Um, and we're going to talk about all the individual officers in a minute. This is, again, just a high-level overview. Now, um, the kingdom is also broken down. It has two regions. These are administrative regions, again, meant to help facilitate paperwork and, and business management. Um, we have a central region and a southern region, and each of those has regional officers. And then, of course, there are local officers. Every group has to have a minimum number of officers, and most groups have a larger docket than just the minimum. This, this diagram is meant to show you kind of a basic idea of the, the, the pecking order or the rank system and how it relates to all of the players in the royal arm of the game. When I say the royal arm, that starts with the crown, king and queen, or, or crown sovereigns of Anstiora, all the way down to the peers of the realm, the peerage is being the highest meritorious award any society, uh, any chapter in the society can give. At, if you look on the left of this image, it does indicate rank. Higher up the chart is the higher the rank, down toward the bottom is the lower the rank. Um, the top part is the royalty. Now, as I said, uh, you have the crown of Anstiora, they reign for six months. They are followed, uh, functionally replaced, uh, when their term is over, by the heirs to the throne. Um, now, they are selected by tournament, a crown tournament, and they serve as heirs to the throne for three months before they become crown. Um, and they are, they are second in rank, the prince and princess, the heirs to the throne, are second only to the crown of Anstiora. Now, you're going to hear, I do want to point out something. You're going to hear me use a lot of gender terms and a lot of uh, androgynous terms in this conversation, and here's why. First of all, um, the overwhelming majority, as in all but one reign that I am aware of in the history of the society, have been two people, uh, two people by law, but have been a traditional male and female couple. Anstiora and um, not Ethelmark. Um, there's one other kingdom. Only two kingdoms have ever put a woman on the throne by right of her own hand, uh, and I'll get to that in a second. So the overwhelming majority of crowns and 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 heirs to the throne are a male knight or a male high-level fighter and his female consort. However. Society law does clearly state that the consorts may be same gendered. And I believe it was North Shield had uh, the first same gendered royal couple uh, on the throne a number of years ago at this point. Um, I cannot remember both their names off the top of my head. One of them was Yehuda. Uh, I believe he was the consort because, and the reason I knew him was he's also a herald, and all of my herald friends were absolutely bonkers over the fact they had an, an active ardent herald sitting the throne up there um it's worth pointing out that the crowns and matter of fact any of the paired couples that go into the leadership roles whether it's the crowns the heirs territorial heirs the landed nobility um these can be married couples they can be dating couples they can be best friends with no romantic involvement whatsoever or they can be individually married to separate spouses and bringing two full households uh, to the equation of supporting them in their role as leader wherever they are in that ladder there. So when you see two people standing together, um, 
there's not an automatic. It's not automatic that they're a married couple or a romantically involved couple. They could be best friends. They could be a married couple. Um, they could be uh, just about anything you could really think of. And I do want to point out, um, the last time I taught this class, someone made a passing comment about that's a sad modern take on how royalty works. And the fact of the matter is, is that historically, we have plenty, plenty of documentation of same gendered crowns under just as diverse set of circumstances. Um, one of the most famous examples that people don't realize is King Leonidas of Sparta. He was king, his wife was not queen. The lines of Sparta had two separate monarchs by two separate families and two separate dynastic lines of succession um, that ruled as co-regents. Um, we have examples of um, romantically involved same-sex partners. We have examples of siblings who sat thrones together. Uh, we have examples of uh, parent and child uh, co-regents. And these are all historical examples in the, the high, early, and late Middle Ages, all the way back to um, there's even some early um, research now showing, uh, or some recent research now showing that some of the early leadership in Babylon and Egypt might have had uh, various combinations of same-sex co-regents. So um, we're learning more every day, but that is very much a historical position that can be taken. Sorry about the tangent there. Um, as I said, we have the crown of Ansteora. They are followed by their heirs. And below them are the territorial royalty of Vindheim, the prince and princess, or if we ever do have them, prince and prince, or princess and princess of Vindheim. Now, the prince and princess of Vindheim within the society or within the kingdom, they are selected by a crown or by a coronet tournament. They reign for six months. There is no heirs period with the territorial uh, royalty there. When they win the tournament, the crown of Ansteora walks out and names them uh, prince and princess over the lands of Vindheim effectively on the spot. So you show up to the tournament. If you win, you're it walking away. There's no, there's no breaking in period there. Um, below the crown actually let's uh, let's talk for a minute about the royalty because we need, we've talked about what they are we need to talk about what they do the royalty of Ansteora are, are expected to um, lead their kingdom inspire their kingdom and reward good works and service uh, by elevating people to appropriate ranks any award in the kingdom of Ansteora and frankly uh, anywhere for that matter in the SCA that carries rank of any sort from an award of arms all the way up to uh, a peerage must have the royalty signature on it. Um, almost always the crown signature on it and there are no exceptions that I'm aware of in Ansteora. So um, when we as a society or as a kingdom want to advance someone in rank, when I want someone to get their award of arms, when I want someone to become a centurion or an iris of merit, when I want someone to receive some sort of ranked recognition, um, the process for that, which we will talk about by the way, but the process for that, by definition, that road goes through the crown of Ansteora. That is part of their primary job, is recognition and advancement of rank. Now, below the royalty is the landed nobility. Um, the landed nobility are the barons and baronesses. Again, the same rules. Um, we can have same gendered um, uh, landed nobility. Matter of fact, my home group, uh, Barony of Eisenfeuer, we were the first in the kingdom to have a uh, same gendered uh, landed nobles. Um, and then they stepped down and a another set of landed nobles were invested and then like two months later the baron in that couple uh he is uh military and he was uh transferred unexpectedly despite the fact he'd been told that was not a possibility um and he was forced to step down and the baroness's uh, good friend stepped up so once again we have a same gendered uh couple ruling as landed nobility in Wiesenfeuer. 
uh, and I just I list that as an example, not any sort of high, uh, not any sort of uh, high ideal, just a example of how these things can come to be and and the different dynamics that shape them. Um, the nobility, almost all baronies are ruled by two landed nobles, though there are examples of one landed uh, of an individual um, running a barony uh, by themselves. They serve as uh, ambassadors to and from the crown of Anstiora, the barons and baronesses of the kingdom, the, the territorial barons and baronesses of the kingdom. Um, they have a regular ongoing line of communication with the crown. As a matter of fact, I'm friends with my local baroness and she routinely talks about how she has a weekly or bi-weekly phone call with the crown of Anstiora. It's a standard point of communication um, anything you say or do in front of a baron or baroness, a landed baron or baroness, unless you've specifically been told otherwise, you probably should just assume you're doing it in front of the crown because part of their job is the crown, the crown literally and has. I've watched this conversation go down. I, I was privileged to be privy to this. It was not that big a deal, but um, I've watched the crown walk up to a landed baron and say, so I heard that uh, so-and-so over there was doing woodwork and he accidentally broke his saw blade. Did he ever get that new saw blade? I was curious uh, how that turned out. So that, that type of little nitpicky individual detail, that does come up in conversation. So that is the level of communication. The, the Baron and Baroness do in fact report back to the Crown and answer the Crown's questions, but also when the Crown has directives or questions or things they need from the populace, part of the landed nobility's job is to convey that to their individual populations in the baronies of the kingdom. Now, um, below that, but, uh, again, on a rank scale, are the peers of the realm. These are all of your, and we're gonna talk about what all the ranks are. If you don't recognize these terms, that's fine. I promise I will get to them. But um, below that, we have the knights, the pelicans, the laurels, and the masters of defense. Um, these are all ranks that are made by the crown. Uh, they cannot be revoked uh, by anyone except for the board of directors, and that's an extreme circumstance. You either get revoked or you resign your rank. That's the only way that works. Um, the peers of the realm are assumed to also have a slightly more distant and not as frequent relationship with the crown, but uh, part of their role as peer is the crown can call them up or reach out to them by letter and say, uh, so how are things going where you are? How are your squires? How are your students? Or they can contact them and say, uh, hey, I'm hearing good things about this person who plays in your group. Have you seen them do this? What do you see? What do you think of them? So that is part of the peer's role is relationship and also advice to the crown. Um, it should also be pointed out, I, I, I glanced over this, the landed nobility of the kingdom are selected by the crown and it is a unilateral decision. The crown, you will hear talk of the crown doing pollings over who should be the next landed nobles of a barony. That polling is strictly an opinion poll designed to let the crown gauge their, gauge the opinions, but it is not a binding vote. There is no tally. There is no number that overrides anything else. Um, the crown is allowed, they shouldn't, and the crowns, you know, good crowns know better, but the crown is allowed by law to ultimately ignore any polling and put whoever they choose in the role of landed nobility. There are no term limits in Anstiora for the landed nobles. Um, they're expected to use their own good judgment as to when they elect to step down. The crown also has unilateral right to remove any landed nobles that they feel need to be removed, and that has taken place. That is not a hollow uh, administrative threat. It's been said that, uh, um, Hugh just pointed out, that it's uh, typically crowns will follow the polls, but they don't have to. And that's, that's kind of a safe summary, but the fact of the matter is it's a lot more complicated than that. And a really good example is the barony of Namron. Um, I won't say any names because uh, it's not really relevant here, but there was one polling where there were four candidates, four candidate couples, as I recall, and absolutely none of the couples got a majority vote. 
As a matter of fact, it was a ranked vote. Um, but on a ranked vote, absolutely no one in this quartet of candidates got a majority. It wasn't even close. However, uh, because it was a ranked vote, one person was everyone's second choice. Like if you if you take out the entire first tier of decisions, everyone agreed on who number two, who their second favorite guy was, or second favorite couple rather, and that's who the crown put in. Um, so, <clears throat> yes, there there is a metric of the crown probably should follow the polling mainly because if they don't, they're going to be dealing with problems and social upheaval because you just put an unpopular figure in there. Um, but they are allowed to inject their own judgment into that equation, and a lot of times they do. Moving on, the administrative arm. This is this is where the actual gears and wheels and pulleys that help the kingdom function work. So, um, kingdom officers. We have a kingdom seneschal. We have a uh, kingdom star principal herald, the earl marshal, the kingdom hospitaller. Um, the Kingdom Minister of Arts and Sciences, the Kingdom Treasurer, the Chronicler, and the Web Minister. Now, what I want to do here is I'm, I'm not going to go into these in detail. We'd be here for another two hours. That's not why we're here. Um, but the Kingdom Seneschal is nominally the leader. I've heard it compared to a club president. I don't particularly like that, but it seems to resonate with people. Um, but they are the focal point for administrative efforts at the top of the kingdom. Um, if it comes down to a decision must be made, my experience has typically been that it's the seneschal that calls the shot. But also the seneschal is the only agent in the kingdom that can enter into contract representations for the SCA. Now, why is that important? It's simple. When you go to rent a location, like you want to rent a hall, you want to rent a campground, that's a contract. Um, and you must be a seneschal or a deputy seneschal in order to sign that paperwork. Otherwise, it is an invalid contract and the SCA won't honor it. So that is one of the seneschal's most important features uh, in the functioning of the SCA is through them, we are able to engage in contract represent or contract signatures for things like rentals and uh, purchases uh, on the part of the SCA. Now, Star Principal Herald, this is a um, huge bureaucratic, uh, this is the apex of a huge bureaucratic uh, machine that helps the, helps the SCA and helps the kingdom run. The Herald's role, first of all, as to what Heralds are and what they do, if you don't know, that is another class unto itself. Um, I have a video, a uh, 15 minute video that gives the briefest of overviews of all the things that Heralds do. but. Relevant to this class, the Office of the Herald uh, is responsible for tracking all the awards given, organizing all of the scrolls uh, for all of the awards, um, it's providing voice heraldry service for the entirety of the kingdom, um, encouraging heraldic education in all of those disciplines, and frankly, so much more. The Star Principal Herald is the head of the College of Heralds. That is the proper name for that entire administrative structure. Um, underneath the Star Principal Herald is Star Signet, and that is the highest ranking scribe in the kingdom. And the College of Scribes is the, is the bureaucratic administrative body which organizes its specific roles organizing and collecting and and monitoring all of the scrolls and creating all of the scrolls that we give out that we make and paint and give out for awards in other kingdoms the college of scribes and their highest ranking scribe are a greater officer that stand on their own in Anstiora, however the college of scribes is a department of the college of heralds and answers to star principal herald the Earl Marshal is our uh, weapons safety officer. Um, the Earl Marshal is also responsible for encouraging education and um, education and activities. But at the end of the day, the primary purpose for our marshalate officers is safety. Um, they, if you look at their training, if you look at what they're required to do, the vast majority of their training 
and the vast majority of the requirements revolve around making sure people don't actually get hurt. I happen to be a thrown weapons marshal and an archery marshal, um, and I can tell you that 90% of my training and 80% or 95% of the work I do uh, revolves around making sure people show up and leave with the same number of holes and scars on their body. Um, <clears throat> Now, the Kingdom Hospitaller, the Hospitaller office is, uh, in a summary, is tasked with encouraging uh, recruitment and retention within the SCA. They are the, nominally speaking, the welcome wagon. They're responsible for making sure questions are answered, um, resources are made available to new and interested members, uh, and so forth. Minister of Arts and Sciences is an educational office. It really is a, it's dependent, especially at the kingdom level, it's uh, very much a bureaucratic office, but uh, Minister of Arts and Sciences is responsible for encouraging and facilitating education and training in the arts and sciences, which also includes research, not just making things. Kingdom Treasurer, uh, also called Exchequer, uh, in some groups it's called Reeve, whatever you want to call it, um, that is the um, financial officer, pure and simple. Um, the Historically, uh, if you ever want some interesting reading, there are actually some outlandishly funny historical stories about the various exchequers and lord purses of England and some of the antics they got into with the crown coin. Um, and I'm not going to say that we're not above some of the funnier stories in our time, but uh, the joke about Kingdom Treasurer, Kingdom Exchequer, is it's the only office that if you do something royally stupid, the IRS could get involved, and we don't want that. Um, so it is a very important office. Uh, it helps us manage our monies and do it correctly. Kingdom Chronicler, um, on top of training and facilitating local officers to produce newsletters, is also responsible for generating the Kingdom Newsletter. The Kingdom Newsletter, in our case called the Black Star, is an official outlet of information on the part of the Kingdom. It's a document that we have to keep up to date. The information in there is vital because that's where official announcements go out. If you want to have an event, um, you have to, by law, you have to announce that event, which means there has to be an ad in the Black Star uh, a certain amount of time before the event goes down. The Kingdom uh, calendar is maintained by a deputy to Kingdom Chronicler. So, uh, again, the, the chronicler, yes, they generate the newsletter, yes, they train local chroniclers, but on a much more important note, especially at the kingdom level, um, they are responsible for making sure official information is out there so that we can say we, we notified people, we told people what was going on, and we have a record that we did that. Uh, and the kingdom web minister is responsible for maintaining uh, the website, the kingdom website, and helping facilitate uh, other deputies for maintaining regional and local websites and maintaining the kingdom's web presence. Now, uh, we have principality officers. You will note the list is very similar. Um, one of the noted differences, we have a principality herald, but we do not have a principality college of heralds. Our heralds fall under the kingdom's college of heralds, but all the other offices there are effectively mirrored. Um, we do have a, nor and this is kind of unique to Anstiora, we have a Northern Regional Chronicler and a Principality Chronicler. And here is why we have that bifurcation, that split. The Principality Chronicler is responsible for maintaining the flow of information to and from the local chroniclers up to the Kingdom Chronicler. The Northern Regional Chronicler, which is a separate office maintained by a separate person, um, excuse me, Principality Chronicler is responsible for generating the Principality Newsletter. I had these reversed, my apologies. They're responsible for creating a newsletter, getting content for it, publishing it, getting all the forms. The Northern Regional Chronicler is responsible for facilitating communication between the local chroniclers and the Kingdom Chronicler. Eventually that office may converge down into one person, but for the time being it was decided that that was too much workload to dump on one person, and I'm inclined to believe that I agree with that myself. Now, we also have regional officers. Um, you notice this list is even shorter. Um, we have regional seneschals, uh, regional herald, regional hospitaller, uh, regional minister of arts sciences, regional tre treasurer, and regional chronicler. 
Um, we have two regions. We used to have three regions. The northernmost region uh, is what were the foundations of what became the principality. The other two regions, these are administrative regions. They can be changed, their borders can be moved, and their um, who they report to can be changed effectively at the whim of the seneschal. They are they are strictly established to help facilitate information flow, um, and as such, part of that that dynamic means they do not have to have the same complete docket of officers that you see at the kingdom level. You notice there is no marshal at that level. All of the local marshals right now report straight to kingdom, and kingdom has the deputy staff to manage that information flow. That's a lot to chew on. It's a lot to process. Please understand, I don't expect anyone to memorize this, but just understand that we have two regions, central and southern. They have dockets of officers at the regional level. Um, we have principality officers. That's a docket of officers at the northern regional area under a slightly different name and different rules. And we, of course, we have a kingdom officer corps that uh, administers all of that. And we have local officers. Now, this is the, um, this chart is one I generated to give you an idea of the structure. And again, it has a lot of what we talked about. All of this hangs over top of the collection of local officers. And this means that the local officers report up to either the principality officer or the regional. Now, local officers, a local group does not necessarily have a full docket of officers, as we've talked about uh, a moment ago. Um, the smallest groups, uh, I believe, cantons, forts, for, or cantons, fortifications, strongholds, um, there are a couple different names and they have slightly different rules depending on the circumstances of the group. They can exist with as little as, I believe, three officers. Um, seneschal, you have to have a seneschal, you have to have an exchequer or a reeve, end of discussion. You have to have an administrator and a financial officer. And I believe it's kind of up to you as to what your third officer is going to be. But you can exist with as little as three officers. Um, larger groups can exist, you know, I think uh, who was saying that uh, Barony of Namron had, you know, her comment was bajillion. I I do think their officer meetings can top twenty sometimes. I've I've attended because I'm friends with a bunch of people down in Namron. But this chart, what I want you to take away from this chart is the understanding that this is the flow of information. If something needs to happen, or if information needs to be passed down. This is the, the shape of the organization and how we administer ourselves. All right, what does all this mean for you? Because I've, I've just given you the, the uh, insanely large list of everything that goes on over your heads. Why is this important to you? And the reason is this, if you have an interest in something, if you want to fight if you want to um if you want to fight if you want to make something you want to do arts and sciences if you want to be an officer if you want to help out with things if you want to be an administrator if you're good with numbers perhaps want to be a financial officer or a deputy financial officer um anything these are the offices that you can talk to because all of those kingdom offices i talked about seneschal reeve ex or seneschal reeve um Minister of Arts and Sciences, Earl Marshall, they all have uh, subordinates down to the local level. And if there's not a local officer for what you're interested in, like if your group doesn't have a Minister of Arts and Sciences, if your group doesn't have a Knights Marshal, you can talk to the hospitaler. If they don't have a hospital, you can talk to the seneschal. But part of the rule of being seneschal is if you don't have an officer for it, the responsibilities roll back onto your lap. Um, but if you have a question as a new member, you want to, you, suppose you want to do pottery or you want to learn how to run an event or you want to, um, frankly, anything. The officer core at the local level is your access point to get more information. And you don't have to walk up and say, I want to do this, but you can say, hey, I'm interested. Can I learn more? Um, when in doubt, start with a hospitaler. That, that's my advice. If there isn't a hospitaler, when in doubt, then you go to the seneschal. Um, 
and there's a really, really good chance you're going to get a handoff there. Because seneschals don't know everything. Matter of fact, most seneschals will tell you they know enough to know all of what they don't know. And that's, that's all right. That is what we want to hear from them. But the seneschal will probably know enough to either know who to point you at to learn more about that subject, or will get your information and go ask who is out there who can answer this question. Um, if you want to talk about registering a name or a device and getting your heraldry registered, you can talk to a herald. And if you can't find a herald, talk to the seneschal and they'll try and put you in touch with a herald. Um, you get what I'm saying. I, I've shown you this whole massive bureaucratic machine above your head and understand that that machine is there. And you don't have to understand the whole machine, but understand that it's there. And the fact that it's that big and the fact that it's that complicated works in your favor because it means there's a lot of people up there who part of their job is to help you figure out how to do something you want to learn more about because that's why it's there. That's, that's part of the reason that machine exists is to help you and I have fun, frankly. Um, so... That's, that's the takeaway. That's why we went through all of that. I want you to understand that that is the shape of things hanging over your head. Um, now, let's do a little bit of uh, talk about local groups, because uh, I, I hinted at this, and I want to, I now want to actually talk about the building blocks at the local level. Uh, Onsteer is currently composed of 34 local groups. This includes 13 baronies, one province, and a number of smaller groups, including shires, cantons, strongholds. I think at one point we had a fort. Now, I want to um, I want to break this down a little bit. Traditionally, a group will hold an event uh, every year. At that event, you will have competitions uh, to select champions for that group. The proceeds for the uh, cost of entering that event will be don't will be put into the group's uh, funds and they'll <laughs> excuse me my studio cat just tried to jump up on the desk and missed um, the uh, the proceeds from that event the money they make will uh, go into the group's funds and it will um, they will use that to fund future projects, making a new list field, getting new pavilions, um, buying fabric for uh, tabards for the baronial guard, whatever it may be. Um, most groups traditionally will have a large served meal at the end of their event. This is called a feast. Um, up until very, very recently, a feast was a absolute staple of SCA culture. Uh, matter of fact, um, about eight, about probably about six years ago now, um, there was a uh, there was some conversation about adjusting the SCA's liability exposure, and one of the attorneys that the board of directors had hired as part of general counsel for the society, which again for a major organization is typical, um, told the SCA, um, "We can probably reduce your liability insurance costs by half or more if you guys stop serving feast." To which the board of directors say, if you want to keep this contract, don't ever say that again. Um, the feast is a staple to SCA culture, and it's something we are proud of, and it's a major social event. Um, it, it's, a major, it's a major cornerstone to how we socialize, how we interact, and how we shape our events. Um, all right. That's a very, very quick summary um of the local groups we have any questions on that and I'm, I'm stopping deliberately because i know there's a lot i'm throwing a lot at you and this is not as in-depth and it's not as detail oriented as the textbook i didn't want it to be so And don't worry about the cat. She's fine. She landed on all four, and she's currently giving me an indignant look of, why did you let that happen? Hey, Bella. All right, come here. Come here. Every, ow. Everyone say hi to Bella. Meow. Okay. Hi, Bella. Hold on. Hi, Bella. Yep. Hey, Bella. Believe it or not, I am not the cat person in this family. She chose me. So, we need to talk about the last two years. 
Um, many of you are going to know some of this, but I need, I need you to sit through this with me because I want you to understand why this is relevant to you in the SCA. Um, as most of you know, in March of 2020, uh, all the way through June, um, the world was just, frankly, catastrophically affected by COVID-19. We underwent um, lockdown orders, uh, the economy ground to a halt as people had to stay home in order to try and stay off the spread of the virus. Um, the SCA went completely virtual with no advanced warning. I was doing online classes in 2019, uh, just a handful of them, and I got gruff for it. I had people tell me, I did not join the SCA to log on. Uh, I don't want you doing online classes. Now, they weren't attending my classes anyway, so I can give you some opinions about what I feel for that. Oh, there. Um, but there was a resistance there from a lot of people saying they do not want to go online to do SCA. Well, uh, before March was over, our options were everyone goes online or we don't have SCA. I mean, there, there, was, no, there was no flexing on this. So all of a sudden, the entire society, whether we wanted to or not, in some cases, quite literally kicking and screaming, got shoved into virtualization um, with with no warning and under the the most damning of edicts because the alternative was to not exist um this shift caused unheard of amounts of internal stress and strife um and it, it caused many conflicts within the sca for many people the simple fact that we went online was enough to drive them out of the sca they said that i did not sign up to go online and log in on a computer and they quit playing. Um, I'm not saying that judgmentally, I understand where they're coming from, but the, the net result was that uh, just in those first few months, a, a not small portion of active members in Onsteora quit playing and some of them to this day have not returned. Um, has the SCA moved forward into 2021 and we started going into online or we started going into our first in-person events after COVID um, and afterward we started getting uh, orders from the board of directors and then from the kingdoms saying that masks must be worn must be worn and um, in Oklahoma there was originally an order that you must show uh, proof of COVID vaccination or a negative COVID test to attend events. Um, then Texas state law was passed saying that that was illegal in Texas. So now Oklahoma uh, only without Steora um, has a rule that says you must show a negative COVID test or co proof of COVID vaccination in order to attend a uh, in-person event or practice. Um, these decisions were not universally liked and uh, furthermore people quit in personal protest of the mask mandates or the vaccination requirements feeling that uh, the measures were not appropriate for the SCA. Um, the social media environment also shed light on previously little known personal opinions held by many members. Some of these statements and displays caused considerable internal conflict within many kingdoms, rewriting the social and interpersonal landscape of society. Um, I'm reading that because I, if I were to go off on a tangent about that, um, if I were to go off on a tangent about that, I would venture in unprofessional territory. But the, the neutral fact of the matter is, is that we as a society were not used to managing an SCA existence in parallel with what we normally put on social media. And because of that, a lot of people, um, a lot of people's personal opinions were made a lot more public than we were ready for. And no one was ready to, and a lot of people were not ready to ignore some of those statements. And that led to massive internal uh, strife and arguments um, that, some friend circles were ripped end from end. New friend circles were created. Um, some of our strongest and most active households um, were frankly incinerated by the, the conflict that came from those, uh, those interactions. It was not a pretty, a pretty chapter in our history. 
Um, in a few extreme cases, uh, members did make overtly bigoted uh, or violently threatening statements to or about others while using their SCA names in the social media posts. These actions resulted in sanctions against them from the kingdom or the board of directors barring them from participation in the SCA. I am not saying that to call attention to it. I am saying that because if you are in the SCA right now for longer than a few months, you will either hear about these, hear reference to them, or may even stumble across old uh, social media posts referring to them. And I would just soon, uh, I would just as soon you know that they took place so you know those way marks are there. Please understand, uh, and this is a fact. I'm, this is not a discussion point. This is not an opinion. The people who were sanctioned by the SCA for their statements were so sanctioned because they made these statements and signed them using their SCA names and or listed the Society for Creative Anachronisms as their employer in their social media profile. That implicates the SCA in their statements and is what gives the SCA jurisdiction to say you're out. These people were not sanctioned for personal opinions. They were sanctioned for intrinsically linking their opinions with the SCA. Um, for new members, and especially those who joined after March of 2021, it is important that you understand that much of our current lexicon tradition and understanding of the SCA and how it works is still, even now in the process of shifting to the new reality that is the modern day. Even leading up, I, I just autocratted Yule Revel, and we were still trying to figure out how is this all going to work under the new rules, because there was no template. Um, uh, Her Excellency is uh, monitoring this room right now, and as the Baroness Northkeep, I'm sure she can attest that there was still, even a few days ago, a lot of how do we make this work? I mean, you guys have been running Winter Kingdom for decades now, since before I believe you and your husband joined. And this, this current situation is just a whole different set of rules we're trying to figure out. So questions. That, that was probably the most important addition I've made to this class. I want people to understand that the SCA we played in three years ago and the SCA we played in now are not only different, but we're never gonna be able to go back to what we were three years ago. The, the landscape we play on has changed. So do we have any questions in the audience uh, from that section? Yes, yes. Um, I, I like don't... Not no, opinions. I, I do not want to dive too far into this but it, since we've opened this particular uh conversation talking point I, I will highlight a couple of things very quickly the the sca has a very specific written set of core values and i'm not going to repeat them because i don't have them memorized but they are they are founded on the modern ideals of inclusivity and non-discrimination the people in question uh, one person made, there, there are three, independent, three incidents I'm citing here. One person um, frankly made a statement worthy of the 1940s Ku Klux Klan. I can put no better spin on it. Um, he got sanctioned for that statement uh, literally. And this was partially happenstance because he, he, he made the comment on a Friday. But they were reading his royal banishment in court 23 hours and 10 minutes later. And that was just barely fast enough, in my opinion. But the reason the Crown had had the right to sanction him was he did it on a, uh, he signed his SCA name was his Facebook name, and he listed uh, Society for Creative Anachronisms as his employer, which th that, was, that was the one-two punch. Um, he associated himself with the SCA, and he made, some, he made a statement that was absolutely repugnant. Um, the... Second such statement was a manifesto that I, frankly, I feel like he was just reaching out to poke the finger in everyone's eye that he possibly could. And guess what? He did. And the crown kicked him. 
And the third person, again, that was, he opened that comment or that post with, this is an SCA post. So no question there. And the last one was not sanctioned for anything he said politically or socially. He outright and literally threatened to kill people in writing by name on his Facebook uh, page. Um, I watched the conversation go down in all of its sad glory. Uh, and he was sanctioned for it. And the, the, that was end of discussion. Um, you make a statement like that, you sign your SCA name, the, the board of directors and the king is not going to blink on that one. That is the history of it. And I'm saying that because there are people out there who push the narrative that these people were kicked out because of their political beliefs. That is not the case. That is a factual statement that that is not the case. So um, I don't want to get too far into the weeds. Um, that which is very easy to do in this day and age. But that, for those that weren't aware, that is the the makeup of that of those incidents in particular. So um, I hope this is not a super like as the SCA gets. It, in terms of, first of all, a little bit of nomenclature for everyone's benefit. Um, you said when you register your heraldic name, you register your name or you register your heraldry. They're two separate items. They both go to the College of Heralds, and that, that's strictly nomenclature for everyone else's benefit. I know exactly what you mean, and you're fine. Um, there is no checklist. The bottom line is that well, let me put it this way. If you are going to say something controversial and you would, or if you're going to say something critical about your employer, it probably would behoove you to make sure you're not wearing your employer's logo on your shirt when you say it. <laughs> that is That is where this comes from. Any organization, any private organization, has the absolute right under U.S. court-established precedent to protect its own interests and to expel members who represent uh, ideals antithetical to their principles, which is highfalutin way of saying, um, if you don't tow the party line, we can kick you out. Um, that's, that's the way it is. You are allowed to sign your SCA name as many times as you want on any media you want. The, there is not a police officer, there's not a, a deputy who's going to walk around checking all that. However, comma, if you go and say something controversial or stupid, and you've signed it with your SCA name, you have just invited the board of directors to this conversation, and you are now subject to their opinion of your statement. Um, now, that being said, if and I'm saying this as someone who has said some stuff that was monumentally stupid in his time, um, if you realize the error of your ways and you make a follow-up statement of, again, signed with the SCA name of, I said this and I now believe this and I apologize for the outcome of my previous statement. Now, I'm not going to speak for the BOD. Any group has the right to protect its group interests. But in, it's been my experience such an apology will go a long way towards mending bridges you might have accidentally set fire to. Um, but in terms of, is there a checklist? No, it's who are you inviting to this conversation? I will also tell you, it is generally speaking a bad idea to list the SCA as your employer in uh, social media. Because number one, they are not your employer, that you are not getting money from them. Um, you may list that you are affiliated with them if you are allowed to. I advise not to because um, if someone else does something stupid and they list SCA as their affiliate, you're now looped into their conversation by guilt by association. Um, so I try and leave that this personal advice. I try and leave the, the affiliations out. Um, but all you have to do is look at my social media profile for three minutes to figure out I'm SCA. So that's, that's more a legalistic approach than a functional one. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, ranks. This part could be an hour, 
but I'm going to cram it down real fast because I'm not going to go over all the ranks in the SCA or all the ranks on steroid. We're going to go over the, the structure that ranks exist in, and then you will be able to um, use that framework to better understand conversations you will have in the future. The SCA has uh, what are called tracks. A track is the specific discipline that you are, or the, the category of discipline that you are studying. On this chart, I have grouped these into five categories, and there is an all others, and I'll explain why that is in a minute. I'm not trying to disrespect uh, a lot of the other disciplines. I'm just trying to make this chart concise for our purposes. Um, the major focuses in the SCA are the combat focuses. You have chivalric combat, heavy weapons. You have uh, rapier combat or your light weapons to use the older term. You have your arts and sciences and research pursuit. Um, and you have your services pursuit. Um, and that is leadership, officership, uh, event running, deputy ship, that type of thing. And I have all others. Now, the fact of the matter is there's a plethora of other things you can study. I'm an archer. Um, there are people that do horseback riding. There are people who do, um, there are a number of uh, youth-centric activities. Not that the youth do it, but people specialize in working with the youth on this. Um, however, what sets all of these apart uh, from the first four we talked about is the ranks that are available to them. Um, and, and this is where we're going to go. First of all, a tract, let me, let me put it this way. A tract is a average statement of what your body of work um, represents. I am arguably on the services track. The overwhelming majority of my efforts fall within the spectrum of service. Now, does that mean I'm only service? No, I have, uh, I have a Sable Talon, which is a fighting award for archery. So that puts me on them. That, that means I have one foot in the martial track. I have three thistles. That's a arts and sciences award. That's more thistles than some laurels have, I will point out, um, which puts me also in the arts and sciences track. But yet the overwhelming majority of what I do is services oriented. So I am said to be on the services track. Um, <clears throat> the tracks in this case are graphically represented as your vertical paths on this, uh, on this chart. Note that there are only four that go all the way up to the top level. And that is because there are four peerages. Not all skill sets that you can practice have a peerage at the end. Some skills that you can study, um, the highest rank that that will get you is a grant of arms. Right now, archers in Onsteora, I mean, archers anywhere in the, in the society, can only earn up to a grant award for their kingdom's grant level archery award. Um, there is no peerage for archer. There is no peerage for equestrian activity. Um, the highest you can get is a grant level equestrian award. So it's not that I wanna disparage either of those or any of the other d activities that you can do, but for the purposes of this graph, I have condensed all others into their own category so that it fits into this visual framework. Now, we've talked about the vertical. Those are the categories of the tracks. Um, the tiers going up, there are four tiers of rank in the SCA. You have non-armidious awards, armidious awards, grant awards, or grant of arms awards, and peerage. Now, let me start with the word that we just heard, and that's armidious, or armidious. It's a Middle English word. Now, what armiduity or an award of arms means is that is the, it's a historical term. And it, the award of arms is actually a piece of paper given to you, signed by the crown, that says you can display heraldry. Because displaying heraldry in itself is a very important thing. And this is a modern, it's, it's a historical concept, but they're also modern. As a matter of fact, I just read an article um, about a retired Royal Navy Admiral who just finished paying 47,000 pounds sterling uh, to register and get his award of arms so his family he, his family could have a coat of arms registered with the English College of Herald. So this is still going on today. And yes, 47,000 pounds sterling is... Uh, or 74,000 pounds sterling, excuse me, is more than some of us pay for our houses. Um, 
So it is, uh, it's an ongoing modern practice in, in royalist and in, in a lot of uh, monarchical governments. But um, in the SCA, we use that term as one of the, to actually, or one of the tiers of rank, but understand that we don't enforce it the same way. You do not have to have an award of arms to display or register heraldry. Flat statement, no exceptions. So you will hear a word of arms, you will hear talk of armaduity, you will hear, for some of us history geeks, you will hear talk about the ability to display arms. Those are historical references. In the SCA, if you register your heraldry and you get it approved before you get your award of arms, you absolutely can display it, uh, you can register it and display it without hesitation. So, um, <clears throat> let's talk about non armidious awards. That's the bottom of the chart here. non armidious awards are awards that carry no rank. Um, they frankly, if you get a non-AOA level award, it does nothing to affect your standing on the, the rank system. It, it, ha it does not advance you one point on the point system we use to literally order all the people in the kingdom. There's actually a master list. You can line up the entirety of the kingdom of Anstiora from the crown to the lowliest, newest AOA rank in order there, there's give you an idea of how much of a bunch of geeks we are is there are actually people that enjoy doing that an aoa award, or a non armidious award does not advance your rank one point however um that does not mean it does not have immense emotional importance to you i have several non armidious awards to my name that are of deep personal significance to me um the other thing is one of the most prestigious awards in the kingdom, uh, the Lion of Anstiora, the Guardian of the Defender of the Dream, which can only be awarded once per reign, and it's perhaps arguably one of the most coveted awards in the kingdom, is a non armidious award. It has no rank, but has immense prestige. So those are your that that is the description of what a non armidious award is. Each tract there has uh at least one non armidious award to it. Some have several. Um, and the all others category, there's a non armidious award for archery. There's one for, for equestrian. Um, there's, a, there's a whole slew of them for children's activities. There's a bunch. So that's, it's a very common award. And like I said, they carry, they, they can and usually do carry massive personal significance to the people receiving them. Um, so it's a very important award. Uh, but in this case, it does not actually carry any rank. Now, the next tier up is the Armidu Armiduous Awards, or the AOA level awards. Now, the most typical of these is the Award of Arms. Um, and you've, if you've been to court at all, you've probably heard it. Pray let all know that we, Rex and Regina Anster, do by this our charter, award unto, or for, uh, but do by this our charter, award unto, name of person, the right and dignity of arms. There's, I think, three or four versions of that scroll rolling around with different text on them, but it, it gets to the point where you hear the first three words and you start saying it in your head. Yes, Bella. Um, the award of arms is the the AOA itself is your general good conduct award. Um, generally is given after about a year of service and steady play within the kingdom. Um, in parallel to that, there are other awards that are of the same rank that also uh, convey or represent that represent specific uh, disciplines within the SCA. Um, as I mentioned, I have thistles. A thistle is an AOA award. Uh, it's an AOA level award. And the thistle is a specific discipline award. I have a thistle in woodworking. I have a thistle in heraldry for the art of heraldry. And I have a thistle in bardcraft, specifically storytelling. All three of those are AOA level awards. And if I had not already received my award of arms, they would still grant me armaduity. Now in the SCA, what armaduity does give you is the ability to call yourself Lord or Lady. Um, that is the title. Before that, you are just whatever your name is. You can sometimes abbreviate that by saying my Lord or my Lady. Um, but the actual title of Lord or Lady or whatever cultural equivalent you want to look towards in any of the inhabited nations of the world pre-1600, 
Um, in order to use that title, you must have uh, an AOA level award conveying to you Armaguity. Um, there is also another AOA level award is the Sable Talent of Onstior, which I mentioned I have that for archery. Uh, that's a fighting award. Um, so there are a number of uh, AOA, there's a whole plethora of them actually, that recognize your skills in a specific tract or discipline. And they all are AOA. Now, um, a good example, Master Bjorlik Folkwinson, who is now a double peer, he did not receive his AOA before his peerage. His armaguity was given to him when he received his thistle for uh, a specific discipline in art that he had studied and entered, I believe, entered into an ANS event and impressed the hell out of everyone. And that's how he got his armaguity. He was given his AOA uh, kind of as a joke, but it's one of those we're gonna we're gonna take care of some of the awards that people forgot about after he received his laurel, um, which you can do. It was kind of a I don't want to say a joke, but it was kind of a, a good natured uh, bit of fun on the part of I believe it was Vanessa who did that for him. Um, so like I said, AOA awards uh, that is a rank advancing award. If you get an AOA, you now uh, precede everyone who does not have an AOA level award uh, um, in the kingdom. And if you just got one, you are immediately behind everyone who came before you and got an AOA before you. Now, next tier up are the grants of arms. Grant is a whole different animal. This is a award that you earn with your blood, sweat, and tears. Um, it represents efforts and work and education and training, usually at a regional or kingdom level. Um, if you if you make grant, um, I like to compare them to the grizzled sergeants of the army. They're not the top echelon; that's the officers. But these are the people you go to to get stuff done. These are the people who are. Um, been there done that uh, depending on your tract a grant of arms can represent anywhere from three to as many as 10 or 12 years of service or study or practice in the society depending on a number of factors um, all of the grants in Anstior are actually orders it's not like I can receive as I mentioned I can receive multiple thistles because that's an individual award your grant of arms is conveyed when you are welcomed into the order of your given path. I was I currently wear the yellow garter with black star for the order of the Iris of Merit. I am a grant level holder for service to the Kingdom of Ansteora. My wife holds uh, two grants. One is the Star of Merit, but she also holds uh, a a. a um, Mine's a star of merit. She holds a star and an iris. And the iris is the or the order of the uh, iris is the grant level award for arts and sciences, and the um, the grant level award for rapier is the order of the blade of merit. Um, actually, I believe the rapier. It's just the blade of merit. It's not an order. But I know that the Centurions, the milit the the, uh, the martial, the heavy weapons grant award is the Centurion, and that is an order, and it's a polled order. The crown has to poll all the Centurions that currently are there, currently at that meeting, and say, hey, I'm thinking about this person, what do you all think? And he has to get their opinion. He doesn't have to follow their opinion, but he has to get their opinion before he in inducts someone into their order. Um, but these are the grant awards, like I said, um, if, you, if you have a grant or if you're working with someone as a grant, that is a large body of experience right there. That is, this is not your average player anymore. This is one of the people that's out there, um, frankly, um, moving. My experience has been these are people who have moved mountains and probably will continue to for a while still. Now, as you can see, for the all others category, that's as high as you're going to get. There are disciplines you can study, things you can do where grant is your terminal award. But for arts and sciences, for service, for rapier combat, and for chivalric combat, there is a master level award you can receive. These are terminal awards. They are called peerages. 
And when I say terminal, that means that merit will carry you no further on this. Um, once you've gotten there, you can either you can keep doing what you're doing, or you and or you can study something else, and or you can branch off and concentrate on teaching or any combination thereof. But there there is no rank to be had above these above the rank of peerage. Now the peerage for the chivalric combat, of course, everyone uh, knows this is knight, the iconic term that dates back to you know the earliest of European fables. The master of defense is actually a, uh, a relatively within the scheme of within the scope of the SCA, a relatively modern organization. It's the most recent of the peerages, but it's based on an actual order of defense from the early Renaissance, I believe, in Italy. Um, but that is the rapier peerage in the SCA. Um, the Order of the Laurel is the peerage for art, sciences, and research. Uh, and of course, the Order, uh, the Order of the Pelican is the peerage for service. Um, in order of creation, the knight within the society is the oldest. And then came the Laurel. And the Laurel was anything that wasn't fighting. And they eventually bifurcated it into arts and sciences and service, Laurel and the Pelican. And those existed for decades. They were all long-established peerages when I joined 25 years ago. Um, it's only been in the last 10 years that the Master of Defense was established as a fourth peerage for the rapier community. So they are the, uh, the newest of the peerages. Um, for, the, for, your, for your records, I believe there is currently only one, in Onsteora, there's only one quadruple peer, and that, that is Master Modius von Mergenheim who uh, was, I believe, first a Laurel, then a Pelican, then a Master of Defense, and then a made a Knight. Um, and uh, to my understanding, he's the only uh, quadruple peer we have. We have, I believe, two triple peers and the rest. There's, there's a plethora of double peers, and of course there's a whole army of people who are single peerage. Um, but uh, um, there, there was someone who set out and actually got all four peerages. It is physically possible, um, just in case you were wondering. All right, award recommendations. I'm gonna be very quick about this, but I need you to understand how this works because this is all of what we just covered, all of that leads into this. I need you to understand this is how you're going to apply the information I just handed you. The award recommendation process starts when someone does something exceptional. You, 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 yes, you, Mr. Mrs. I've been playing three weeks or I haven't been to my first event yet, or I've been at my computer this entire time. I'm talking to you. You are part of this equation. Um, the process starts when someone does something exceptional. You witness someone do something awesome, good, generous, amazing, whatever. Pick your adjective. What you see. This is where this equation starts. As a member of the populace, you see this happen. That is the critical thing. You, it, it's This process of getting people awards starts with you seeing it. Someone does something and someone else witnesses it or hears about it or sees the results of it and asks, that is the first step in this dynamic. The person who witnesses it then fills out an award recommendation form to the crown about the person they saw or heard or learned about doing something exceptional. This is the first step that gets information to the crown. Like I said, any award that carries any rank has to have the crown signature and a discussion. So the crown is included in this conversation. Um, in that link that I listed at the beginning of the show notes, or in the show notes that I list at the beginning of the chat, and I'll, I'll share them again when we're done with the class, um, there's a link to the award recommendations form. And if you have any questions about what that form is or how to fill it out, talk to your local herald or talk to your local seneschal um, or reach out to me. I'll do my best to help you out on that. But filling out this form gets the information of, I saw this person do this, and I want you to know about it. That is the critical step here. The Crown will review these forms. They, that's part of their job. Like I said, part of their job is the recognition and advancement of their populace for good conduct and deeds. This is the mechanics of how that does, happens. 
any, every crown I've ever spoken with, I've been playing a quarter century, I've had a, a, the blessed opportunity to speak with a number of past crowns. They will tell you that they set aside time every week, like hours. Like I, one of them said that they set aside the first four hours of every Saturday that they weren't at an event. And if it, they were an event, I think they did the, the first four hours of the Monday after an event or something like that. Just going through, just so they had time to go through all their emails, all their award recommendations, and review all the forms they got and give them the time they deserve. So this is not something they're doing in passing. This is part of their core job as Crown, is to look at these award recommendations. The Crown will consult with the landed nobles and the peers who may know more about this subject. If you live in a canton or a shire or a fort or some little group out in the middle of nowhere, chances are still that there is a, a knight or a laurel or a pelican or a master of defense or maybe a landed baron from a neighboring barony had stopped by at a meeting or has attended an online activity or was at your last event. The crown will call and ask these questions. They will have these conversations. They will do these inquiries. That is part of their job and that is part of the responsibility of the landed nobles and the peers to be that part of that conversation. So the crown will do research into these subjects. The crown will decide if the award is appropriate. Now, part of the award recommendation form says, what award are you recommending this person for? If you're not sure, you have to fill out something. The form will let you leave it blank. Take your best guess. The crown is not bound by that, and they can decide that award isn't appropriate, but that doesn't mean they're going to ignore the form. They may decide, okay, this isn't grant-level work, but it sure as hell is AOA-level work, and we're going to do this award instead. That is well within their purview. But the crown will finally codify, okay, here's the award that's being recommended. Here's what we're seeing. Is it appropriate to give this award? Is it appropriate to give the award at all or any award at all? If they decide so, the award is given. Now, just kind of give the other tail on this. If they decide that an award's not appropriate, it the whole process dies at that step. For whatever reason, they decide not to give that award and the, the process stops. They don't have to reply. They don't have to say anything. They don't even have to publicly acknowledge, they don't have to privately acknowledge that they received the award recommendation. That's the way the system works. Um, so if you put in an award recommendation and no one got the award, um, wait till the next reign and try again. Because all these forms don't carry over between reigns, by the way. If, if you send it to one king and another king's on the throne, send in another award rec. But if they do decide the award is going to happen, if they do decide that they want to give this award out, they will begin the process of making sure there is a scroll, that it is filled out, and that there will be someone to give that award, whether it's going to be them at the next event they are at, or whether they're going to give it to a landed noble who's at the next event this person will be at to get for them to hand it out in a royal court held by them, or some other means. I mean, there are, there are a couple of ways available to the Crown, but the Crown will then begin the process of actually getting the award made and handed out uh, in order. All right. That's the class. And I think I actually cut that in in 15 minutes short of what was worried it was going to be.